Hello, this is Jack Jackson. We're going to continue our lecture that we had started last time on complex number system and operations. If you recall, we started by building up the number system. We started with the most basic numbers, the counting numbers, natural numbers. And from there, we talked about the most basic operation, addition. Then we talked about doing and undoing. So if we want to do addition, we want to be able to undo addition. This led us to the concept of subtraction. And, of course, then if we wanted to talk about subtraction and we wanted to do any natural number minus any other natural number, that forced us to increase the number system to a larger number system that we call the integers. Now we're going to expand in a slightly different way. We're going to go back to the natural number system. We're going to talk about what happens if we repeatedly add the same thing over and over and over and over again. One of the things that we want to do with algebra is find uh, ways to take repeated reasoning and um, such as adding the same thing over and over and over again and just come out with a pattern or way of uh, shortcut for that. Well, This is going to lead us to the idea of multiplication. We're going to look at some properties of multiplication, especially the distributive property. And then when we try to undo multiplication, we're going to go to the operation of, of division. And then that's going to, in turn, lead us to expand our number system once again to the rational numbers. So these are our basic topics for this lecture. Now, again, we'd like to repeat uh, an operation over and over again. So, for example, we might want to add a bunch of 2's together, like 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, which, of course, is, is 10. Well, this can be cumbersome if there are very many twos, so we'd like a shortcut notation for this repeated addition, and we call this new shortcut notation, or this new operation, multiplication. So here we have five twos added together. We'll, we will call that five times two, and there's several notations. We'll just say five with a little cross uh, X kind of thing here for multiplication, or a raised dot, or we'll just write two things together. Usually in algebra, we have a tendency to choose the last notation over the other two because the one with the little cross looks like the letter X, which is often used for a variable in algebra. The one with the raised dot might be confused with a decimal point, which is a lower dot. And we write two things together. Of course, if we just write a 5 and a 2 together, it would be 52. So here we separate with parentheses. But if you don't see an operation in there, it's usually it's implied multiplication here. So we will define a times b as repeatedly adding b a total of a times. So if we say a times b equals c, then a and b are called the factors, and c is called the product. Now the way we're going to interpret this is the first factor indicates the number of groups and the second factor indicates the size of the number in each group. Then we simply add these groups together. So for example, 3 times 4 indicates 3 groups of 4 added together. So 3 times 4 means 4 plus 4 plus 4. And you can see here in the diagram I've got 3 groups, 1, 2, 3 groups. Within each group we have 1, 2, 3, 4. So 3 groups of 4 and then we add all those together. That is 4 plus 4 plus 4, which is 12. So once again, 3 times 4 indicates 3 groups of 4 added together. So we could take this, however, and reorganize it so that we put our groups, of, our groups in rows. So here's a group of 4, here's a group of 4, here's a group of 4, and we have 3 groups of 4. We could even take these blocks and sort of smash them together so that now we have 3 rows of 4 um, kind of linked together. And if we wanted to, we could even push all that together and we have a rectangular array. Here I'm thinking of actually little blocks, so I'm thinking three dimensions. But instead of little blocks, I could just have flat uh, square tiles. And we put that together, here is uh, three times four. Each row is a group, and there are um, three of those groups, because there's three rows. Within each group, we have four items. So the number of columns is the number of items per group. The number of rows is the number of groups. So the first factor is the number of rows, or how tall this is, the height. And the second factor is the width, or the number 
per group are the, how many columns we get. So it's rows by columns. So this is an so the then we count the number of tiles that fill this. Well, that's the concept of area is how many little square tiles will fit in, it, in an area. So we can think of this as an area model. Three times four is the area of a rectangle that is three tall and four wide. So remember that three times four indicates three groups of four added together. That is four plus four plus four, which is twelve. That's a that can be visualized as a rectangle that has three tall and four wide. Now notice that four times three is really a completely different operation. It says we have four groups and there are three in each group, so it's four threes added together. So four times three is three plus three plus three plus three. But notice that's also twelve. And of course we could illustrate that by a rectangle that is four tall and three wide. Well, it's not too surprising to see that three times four has got to be the same as four times three because when you look at these two rectangular arrangements you can see that they're really the same size and shape what's happened is you just take the first one and rotate it 90 degrees and you get the second one so these two shapes are are the same shape they're congruent shapes they have the same area and so three times four must be the same as four times three well we can do this with any numbers that we want and if you've got a rectangle that's A tall and B wide, you just turn it to get one that's B tall and A wide, and so that says that A times B equals B times A for all natural numbers A and B. So let's, uh, let's do a couple exercises here, a few exercises. So in this exercise, I'd like you to define how we, how we define multiplication of natural numbers, explain what the operation 3 times 5 actually means, Give a real-world application problem not involving an area for which 3 times 5 is the answer, and then illustrate 3 times 5 also as an area. So get yourself out maybe some graph paper to do this. will be the easiest way. And work out this exercise, and then come back uh, after you finish. Press pause now. Okay, now you're back, and hopefully you've noticed that you've worked through this exercise, and here's what we should get. Multiplication is defined as repeated addition. The first factor indicates the number of times that the second factor is used as an add-in. So, for example, 3 times 5 means 3 fives added together, 5 plus 5 plus 5. Of course, that turns out to be 15. In other words, this is three groups of size 5 added together. So how about a real-world application? Now, remember, when you get a real-world application, you have to set up some scenario, ask a question, and then answer the question, and in this case we want the answer of the question to basically be 3 times 5. So that means 3 groups of 5. So we need some kind of application that, that's going to give us 3 groups of 5. So here's an example. Uh, John earned $5 each day for 3 days. How much did John earn altogether? Well, he earned 3 days, and, he had, and then times $5 per day, that gives him $15 total. So illustrate this is an area. That would be an area of a rectangle. It should be the first number is how tall it is, the height, 3. And the second number is the how wide it is, the width, 5. So it's a 3 by 5. And if you count those blocks, of course, you'll get 15. All right, now let's do this exercise. What does the operation 5 times 3 mean? Give a real-world application problem not involving an area for which 5 times 3 is the answer, not 3 times 5 because we're doing a slightly different interpretation here but illustrate 5 times 3 as an area. Again, just take out your graph paper that you did the last problem on, and you can do that one there. Go ahead and do this now. Press pause. Okay, well, 5 times 3 is 5 threes added together. That's 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, which is 15. In other words, 5 groups of size 3 added together. So let's do a real-world application. This time, it, our application should be something to do with five groups of three. Not three groups of five, which would be three times five. So let's see here. Uh, one example is you collect five bags, each containing three cookies. How many cookies did you collect? Well, the five bags we know is the groups, and we know there are three in each group. So that's five bags times three cookies per bag equals 15 cookies. Illustrate this as an area. Well, it should be a rectangle, and it should be five tall 
and 3y. So look at these two things. We got, got these two rectangles that we just had from our two previous problems. What is the relationship between the two areas above? And if we want to generalize this concept, what property does this prove? So go ahead and work this now. Uh, please press pause now. Okay, well we see that these figures are just rotations of each other, so the two areas are the same. In general, AB, or A times B, can be written as an area of a rectangle, A units tall and B units wide, whereas BA can be represented as an area of a rectangle, B units tall and A units wide. By rotating one of these rectangles 90 degrees, we obtain the other rectangle, so they must have the same area. This proves the commutative property of multiplication, that is, a times b equals b times a, for any natural number. In fact, this is true for any complex number. So we see now that we have some algebraic properties of addition and multiplication. And these are going to hold for any natural numbers A, B, and C. In fact, they're going to hold for the larger sets of integers. They're going to hold in the uh, real numbers and even in the complex numbers as well. So the first thing is closure. A plus B is a natural number. So if you add two natural numbers, you're going to get a natural number. Multiplication is closed. So if you multiply two natural numbers, you get a natural number. The associative property works. If you take A plus B first and then add C, you can get the same thing as if you add the B and the C together and then add A. Same thing works for multiplication. A times B first and then multiply by C is the same as A times B times C. In other words, do the B times C first and then multiply by A. A by that. The commutative property also works. A plus B is the same as B plus A, that should say. A plus B is the same as B plus A. I'll fix that on the slide. And then A times B is the same as B. A times B is the same as B times A. So these C's should be A's in this, in this uh, line here. So. And then we have an identity element. The identity element for addition is 0. A plus 0 is the same as 0 plus A, which is A. So A retains its identity when you add 0. What's going to be the multiplicative identity? Well, you know it's 1. A times 1 is the same as 1 times A, which is A again. Now we come to one other property that's going to be new to us. This is going to be a pretty important one. Actually, all these properties are very important. And this one is called the distributive property of multiplication over addition. So the properties we just looked at on the previous page were either just about multiplication or just about addition. But this one is about the combination of multiplication and addition. So I want to consider this problem here. 2 times parentheses 5 plus 3. Now because of the parentheses we're going to add the 5 and 3 first to get 8. So what we're really talking about is just the problem 2 times 8. Of course we know that's 16. How would we illustrate 2 times 8? Well with our area model this would be a rectangle that's 2 high and 8 wide. So if you look down here at this illustration at the bottom the big rectangle that you see here is 2, eight, two high and 8 wide. 2 high and 8 wide. So the, the total number of blocks that we have here, 16, is 2 times 8. Of course, 8 is 5 times 5 plus 3, so this is 2 times 5 plus 3 as well. So on the one hand, we could do the addition first, 5 plus 3, get 8, then 2 times 8, and get 16. But there's another way of looking at this. We can break it into the blue part and the red part that you see here. The blue part here on the left is a rectangle that's 2 tall and 5 wide. Okay, just the blue part here. And of course that's 2 times 5 is 10 is how many blocks we have in that part. And we look how many blocks or tiles we have in the other part. That's 2 tall and 3 wide. That's 2 times 3 is 6 in the red part over there. Well notice that you can do it like this. You can do the 2 times 5 and get the 10 and the 2 times 3 and get 6 and add those up and we still get the total 16 blocks. So this says 2 times 5 plus 3 is the same as 2 times 5 plus 2 times 3. Well we can generalize this and this becomes what's called the distributive property. 
So here's our picture here. doesn't really matter how long this is, any length we have here for B. This first blue rectangle on the left is A tall and B wide. So it's A times B. The rectangle on the right is uh, A tall and C wide. Again, it doesn't really matter how tall A is or how wide C is. Um, as long, you know, it's still A times C. So the total is A times B plus A times C. But on the other hand, we can think of it as one rectangle. Okay, A tall, and then how wide is it? Well, it's B plus C wide. So A times B plus C equals A times B plus A times C. So we can think of it as two parts, that's on the right, or one big part, and that's on the left. So that's the distributive property. So we can use the distributive property to expand some stuff out. Now this one's kind of a little ridiculous, the first one here, but 3 times 6, of course, is 18. But if we wanted to think of 6 as 2 plus 4, then we could break it apart and say that's 3 times 2 plus 3 times 4. So that's 6 plus 12, which is, of course, also 18. But where it comes in handy, as far as actually really using it, is when we have an unknown quantity uh, in the middle of our expression. Like we have 3 times x plus 4. Well, we could take this 3 and distribute across here. And what do we get? We get the 3 times x, which you just, we just write as 3x, plus the 3 times 4. 3 times 4 is 12. And so we've used the distributive property there. Here, the next one, similarly, 5 times x is 5x, and 5 times 2 is 10. So going this way, we call expanding or multiplying out, and we use the distributive property. But the distributive property is based on an equals, and equals work in both directions. So we can go the other direction. We can take something like 4 plus 14. They have a common factor of 2. So if we wanted to, we could factor out a 2, and what's left is 2 plus 7. Well, let's think about it. If we were to expand this on the right, we'd go 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 7 is 14. So how did I get the 2 and 7? Well, to go from the 2 and the 7 to the 4 and the 14, I'm multiplying by 2. The opposite is dividing by 2. So I, I see that they have a 2 in common, common factor of 2, so I pull that out front and to find the numbers inside I divide. 4 divided by 2 is 2, 14 divided by 2 is 7. Again, not so much useful there. Uh, if we wanted to figure out what 4 plus 14 was, we'd probably just add them up and say 18 and be done with it. But when you have an expression like this down here, it might be useful to us to factor it sometimes. So notice that the 4 and the 6 have a 2 in common. We bring that out. 4x divided by 2 is 2x, plus 6 divided by 2 is 3. And so you can expand the right side out and you'll get the left, or you can factor the left and get the right side. Similarly, in the next example, we factor out a common factor of 5, and the last one a common factor of 3. So sometimes we would rather have the form on the right, sometimes we would rather have the form on the left. It's not necessarily that one is simpler or better than the other one, it's just sometimes one is more useful in a certain situation than the other. So we want to be comfortable with going back and forth between these two forms. Again, if we go from this first example, the, what's on the left is already factored, we can multiply it out, that's called expanding it, using the distributive property. Down here, the one on the left is expanded, we factor it and put it over here. It's called factored form because we have two things multiplied together at the end. So here are some examples here. Um, that red one is not supposed to be there. State the distributive property, use the distributive property to expand those two examples, and then use the distributive property to factor the following expressions, factoring out the greatest common divisor. Give you a few seconds to do this and then come back. Press pause now. Okay, so the distributive property says A times parentheses B plus C, close parentheses, equals A times B plus A times C. Uh, right now we've done it for any integers A, B, and C, but it's actually true for any complex numbers A, B, and C. We use the distributive property here to expand the following expressions. 3 times parentheses x plus 2 is 3 times x plus 3 times 2, so that's 3x plus 6. 5 times 3x plus 7 is 5 times 3x, which is 15x, plus 5 times 7, which is 35. Going backwards, 
we want to factor. 3x plus 6, we see that 3 and 6 have a common factor of 3, so we factor that out. 3x divided by 3 is x, 6 divided by x is, uh, 6 divided by 3 is 2, so we get 3 times parentheses x plus 2, close parentheses. 15 and 9 have a common factor of 3, so we factor the 3 out. 15x divided by 3 is 5x, 9 divided by 3 is 3, so we get an answer of 3 times parentheses 5x plus 3, close parentheses. 4x plus 2, we can factor a 2 out and get 2 times parentheses 2x plus 1. Now what we want to do is to develop an algorithm for multiplying multi-digit natural numbers. This is an algorithm or uh, some versions of one of these algorithms I'm not sure that you studied back in elementary school somewhere. So suppose we have 35 times 46. Well, What does that mean? Well it means 35 groups of 46 added together. We've also seen that if we put our groups in rows and smash it together into a rectangle we get a rectangle that's 35 tall and 46 wide. And if you'll count this, uh, you'll see little blocks in this example, and we have 35, so this is 10, 20, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 35 tall. And how wide? Well, 10, 20, 30, 40, 41, 42, 43, 45, 46. 46 wide. So this is blocks. 35 tall and 46 wide. We might think of that all one color blocks. It's just, just a big rectangle. But I want to notice that we can break this into four regions. And notice where I broke it is between the tens and the ones here. So we've got three tens tall and then four, uh, five more t ones. And how many, how many wide? We have four tens wide and then six more. So between the tens and the ones here, and the tens of the ones here, I broke it and that made four parts which I colored four different colors, each a different color. Now we can think of each of these blocks as being uh, a part of what happens if we apply the distributive property. So if we take th 35 times 46, we can think of 46 as 40 plus 6. So then we distribute the 35, that's 35 times 40 plus 35 times 6. Now we can think of the 35 as 30 plus 5 in both cases. In the left part, we, have the, we can distribute the 40 and we have 30 times 40 plus 5 times 40. And then we distribute the 6 on the right part and we get 30 times 6 plus 5 times 6. Now if you'll notice, these four things are exactly the areas of these four regions, or the number of blocks in these four regions, and I've got the colors matching up. So let's start with the green. Okay, The green we got from this distributive property is 5 times 6. Well, if you look, that's exactly the area of this green rectangle. It is 5 tall and 6 wide, so it's 5 times 6. Now let's do the, do the uh, yellow or oranges color here. 30 times 6. That's going to be the yellow here. Notice that's a rectangle that's 30 tall and 6 wide. Well, sure enough, that's exactly what we have for the yellow rectangle, 30 tall and 6 wide. How about the red? That's a rectangle 5 tall and 40 wide. That's exactly the red rectangle. And, of course, the blue is 30 tall and 40 wide. So the 1,200, that partial product, 30 times 40, is how many blue blocks we have here, or blue tiles. How many red tiles do we have? Well, we have 5 times 40 is 20 red tiles. The orange tiles, we have 30 tall and, 60, and 6 wide. So that's 30 times 6 is 180 orange tiles. And we have 5 times 6 for the rectangle here of green tiles. So we have 30 green tiles. So the total tiles, then, I can just add up the blue, red, orange and green tiles together, 100, 100, ah, 1,200 blue tiles plus 200 red tiles plus 180 orange tiles plus 30 green tiles makes a total of 1,610 tiles altogether. Now, that, why does this picture work or why does the distributive pro it, these things are go hand in hand? 
This picture illustrates what's happening in the distributive property, and the distributive property works because you can do this thing with the picture. So they kind of work, one, one implies the other. Now, another thing that's kind of cool about this here is I've got all these individual grid, grid lines, but notice I have some darker grid lines. If I take away the lighter grid lines, we can see these pieces, and this is going to be a nice little feature here if we think about it. So the green pieces uh, is still just individual units. Three times, uh, let's see, it's five times six. That's our 30 green units. But let's look at the red part, for example. If you look at the figure over here on the left, we see that the red part is a rectangle that is five tall and 40 wide. Okay? So that's five times 40. But if we erase the little ones in the middle, we see that these are automatically longs or groups of 10. So what we can see is we can think of this being blocks here as five blocks tall and four blocks wide. Okay, But now the blocks are not individual blocks, they're actually groups of 10 blocks. They're longs, they're tens. Okay, So if you, you could put this out with base 10 blocks. Okay, and we would have a total of, um, let's see, 5 times 4 is 20, but 20 what? 20 tens. Well, 20 tens is actually 200. So, in other words, we could take this, this 5 and this 5 and snap together and make a, make a uh, flat of 100. And these 5 and these 5, all these could snap together and make a flat of 100, of, 100, of 10 tens. But notice, to figure this out, we only really had to do a single digit times a single digit multiplication. We only had to do 5 times 4. Similarly, the orange here is naturally vertical longs, rather than the horizontal longs like the red one. And we see that it's naturally just 3 longs tall and 5, uh, let's see, what was it, 6 units wide. Right? So it's 3 times 6 is all we have to do, which is 18. We only have to do a single digit multiplication. 3 times 6, which is 18, but 18 what? 18 longs or groups of 10. So 18 tens are 180. And, and the blue part, it naturally falls into flats of 100 or groups of 100 here. And how many of those big squares do we have? Well, it's 3 tall and 4 wide, which is a total of 12 squares, but each square represents actually 100 individual items. So that's 12 flats of 100 or 12 hundreds. Uh, we can put 10 of them together and make a big uh, cube of 1,000, and then you have two of the hundreds left over, so that's 1,200. So notice that this really boils down to doing four single digit times single digit multiplications as long as we can just keep track of what place value we're in, whether we're grouping in singles like the green part, or longs of 10 or groups of 10 like the orange and the red part, or whether we're grouping in flats or groups of 100 like the blue part, or even larger groups if we have more than two digit times two digits. This leads us to some nice algorithms. So you see the distributive property down here, and you see the blocks up here. But let's look at this, what I'm going to call the expanded standard algorithm down here in the middle at the bottom. So we're doing 35 times 46. Well, what we can do is just do the 6 times the 5, which is 30, and that's our 30 green individual items. Then we can do the 6 times the 3, which is 18, but it's not really 6 times 3, it's really 6 times 30, or 30 times 6, either way you say it. And so what is that? That's our 18 longs that you see here in orange, or 180. Then we can do the 4 times 5, which is 20, but 20 what? It's really 40 times 5, so that's 20 uh, longs, that's the red ones, or 200. And finally, we do 4 times 3, which is 12, but 12 what? 12 hundreds, right? So it's really 40 times 30, so that's 12 hundreds. And now if we just line things up here, remember we put all these zeros in so that we get the partial products to be exactly what they're supposed to be. And notice the 30, 180, 200, and, and 1,200 are exactly the same four numbers that we get from our distributive property over here. And each, they represent the number of blocks, number of the little blocks, 
in the diagram up here that uh, corresponds to that color. Everything on this page, the colors coordinate. Now we just add this up. 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 is 0 units. 3 plus 8 is plus 0 plus 0 is 11 groups of 10. So that's one group of 10 and one that we regroup and pull over here. That's one flat. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 flats then and one cube. So if we look at this, we should be able to get 10. There's 8, 9, 10. Uh, of these make a big blue flat, a big blue cube. Then how many flats do we have left over? should be six. Two of them are blue here. There's a red one here and a red one here. So now we're up to one, two, three, four. And then there'll be two more that are orange. Uh, this is six wide, so six and four more. And then, and then we get the orange ones there. Well, we get, I'm sorry, we get two orange ones and then the rest of the orange with some of the green because remember we regrouped, that's going to make another flat. And when it's all said and done, we end up with one of the either orange or green left over uh, for a long. Now, oftentimes you'll see this in a condensed form. You're doing exactly the steps that are done here. You just don't write it down. So you could start by learning it this way. Then you could sort of not write, not write this part out here. Just do this in your head and just write down the part that you see here. But you can also condense this a little bit, and this is the way I was taught how to do it in school. 6 times 5 is 30. Write down the 0 and just keep the 3 in your head. 6 times 3 is 18, plus the 3 is, is 21, so that's 210. Well, what is the 210? It's 6 times 35, but what it really is is the 6 times the 5 and the 30 times 6 added together. So you're still finding these two things, you're just keeping some of it in your head and adding them together as you go. Then I put a zero for a placeholder. This is not lined up perfectly, it should be over a little bit. And I should have, do the rest. I say four times five is 20, so that's a zero here. And I keep the two in my head. Four times three is 12, plus the two more is 14. And if these are lined up, right, it would be zero plus zero is here, one plus zero is one. 2 plus 4 is 6, and then 1 here. So this is just a condensed version of that. I think the expanded version shows you a little bit better what's actually happening, both in the distributive and in this picture. Now there's another algorithm some of you may have seen before, and some of you may not have seen it. It's called the lattice algorithm, and it has certain advantages and certain disadvantages here. Um, it's actually probably easier to perform. It's a little less obvious what's going on in the place value. But what it really does is it really points out the fact that you're really just doing single digit times single digit multiplication. You write your 3, 5, and your 4, 6 here. And then you do 6 times 5 goes in this box right here. Well, 6 times 5 is 30, so you write 30 like that. 3, 0. 4 times 5 is 20, so 20 is here. 4 times 3 is 12, so that goes 12 is here. And 6 times 3 is 18, which goes here. Then you come across the diagonal, that zero is your units. Anything in this diagonal is a long or group of 10. So 8 plus 3 plus 0 is 11, so it's 1 here. We carry 1 over here and keep it in our head, and regroup it, carry it over. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 flats, and then 1 cube. So 1, 6, 1, 0 is our answer. So that's the lattice algorithm. Now, you can take any of these algorithms, the distributive property, the expanded algorithm, the standard one, I'm going to call it the standard one because it's the way I was taught, uh, the condensed version of the standard, uh, and then the lattice algorithm. You can take any one of those and you can make this work for uh, three digits times two digits or you know, 15 digits times 27 digits if you had that kind of patience. You could do it with this way. But notice, because of this algorithm, you don't have to memorize multiplication tables up uh, other than single digit times single digit. Except you do need to know what happens when you multiply by, by 10, and that just increases everything one place value. So really, you should know your multiplication tables up to um, 10 by 10, but there's no need to memorize beyond that because this algorithm allows us to reduce all multiplication problems down to single digit times single digit problems, a bunch of them perhaps, and then we add those little partial products up. 
So let's see if you followed all that. What I'd like you to do now is get a piece of graph paper out, get you four colored pencils, okay, and you're going to do what we just did with 24 times 37. So we want a four colored array of blocks uh, representation using colored pencils on graph paper. You want to show the actual blocks. Um, you want to show the distributive property, the expanded standard algorithm, the condensed standard algorithm, the lattice algorithm, and coordinate the same four colors throughout. So just to make this a little easier on you, I'm going to back up before I tell you to pause. Now remember it's 24 times 37. Write that down. 24 times 37 and we're going to go back to here and basically I want you to reproduce this entire page not for this problem but for 24 times 37. Please do that and we'll come back and check your answer in a few minutes. Press pause now. Okay, so you're supposed to take this idea here and do exactly everything you see here on this page for 24 times 37. Well, if you did that, this is basically what you should have come up with. So here's our blocks, 24 tall and 37 wide, showing the individual blocks, and this is showing it uh, regrouped into longs and flats where they naturally occur. The distributive property, you can see it worked out. First we break 37 as 30 plus 7, distribute the 24, then take 24 as 20 plus 4 and distribute the 30 and the 7. So we use the distributive property um, once from here to here, second time there, and a third time there. We used it three times. And that allows us to get the four parts. Notice that the four parts are the first term here, and the, the first digit here, and the first digit here. The four and the three are the inner two digits. Okay? The orange ones are the outer two digits and the green ones are the last two digits. First, first, outer, inner, last. Not in the order I did it here. If you put it first, outer, inner, last, it spells the word FOIL. Okay, now the expanded algorithm, we see it down here, and the condensed version here, and the lattice version here. So if you need to, pause this and, and check your, your work carefully, but we're going to go on now. Okay, well, zero has a lot of very special properties. It's the additive identity, but it turns out it has some special multiplication properties as well. Zero times a, or a times zero, is zero for any integer a. Actually, for any complex number a, this is also true. And it has some physical interpretation. If you think of it as groups, and uh, then the first one, 0 times a, says we have 0 groups, and the a really doesn't matter what size we have. If we don't have any groups, we don't have any objects. So there's going to be 0 objects to get all together. And the second part, when you say a times 0 is 0, that also makes sense in a physical interpretation because it says it doesn't matter how many groups we have, if they all have 0 objects in them, we put it all together, we still have zero objects. So this makes sense with our interpretation of multiplication of whole numbers. Now this also works conversely, that is backwards. Here we said if you multiply zero times a number you have to get zero. But if you go backwards it says if you end up with zero and you've gotten it from multiplying two numbers then one of those two numbers also has to be zero. So the only way you can get a product of zero is for one of the two factors to be zero. Okay, and this is very useful in solving equations by factoring. Now in the real numbers, or in the rational numbers, c equals zero is the only number that has the property a times b equals c implies that a equals c or b equals c. So for example, if c is 12, and you say a times b is 12. It doesn't, it's not true that either a has to be 12 or, or c has to be 12. They could be 1 and 12, but they could be 3 and 4 or 2 and 6. Um, even if you had a prime number like um, 5, and you have two numbers that multiply together to be 5, 
Um, if you're in the natural numbers, one of them has to be 5, but if you allow fractions, then it doesn't have to be. It could be 10 and 1 half and, that, and still get 5 for a product. So uh, this number uh, a times b equals 0, that's 0 if and only if either a is 0 or b is 0. Okay. So very interesting property there. Very interesting property of zero. So how do we perform uh, interpret multiplication of integers? Well, let's look at a few cases. Suppose the first number is a natural number. Of course, natural numbers are integers, so that's a possibility. Well, if the first number is a natural number, then we already know what to do. Our original interpretation is just fine. Remember, our original interpretation says the first factor tells you how many times to list the second number as a uh, add-in and put it together. 3 times negative 2 means 3 negative 2's added together. That makes perfect sense. Negative 2 plus negative 2 plus negative 2, we know how to do that. That's negative 6. So no problems there. Well, what if the first number is a negative? Well, then we're in a little bit of a trouble because for example, negative 4 times 2, you can't think of listing 2 negative 4 times and add it together. That just doesn't make sense anymore. So we have to expand our idea of what multiplication means a little bit. But now one of the things we want to be true is the commutative property. So if the second number is a natural number, we really don't have a problem. We know that negative 4 times 2 better be the same thing as 2 times negative 4. And Oh, hey, we know how to do that one. That's negative 4 plus negative 4. So that's negative 8. But now, that just puts us off to the next question. What if they're both negative? So let's just put the crux of the matter down to the simplest one that's, that's really the problem. How do we make sense out of negative 1 times negative 1? What does that mean and why? Well, you guys have probably studied this before and know the answer that negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. But why does that have to be true? Or is that just something we made up, or does it have to be true to make things work out? Well, let's look at a couple examples here of how we might think of that. The first one is pattern extension. Let's look at A being 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2, and multiply by negative 1. Well, we know what negative 1 times 5 is. It's 5 times negative 1, which is negative 5. Negative 1 times 4 is negative 4. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 times 0 is 0. Those we know how to do. So what would make sense in this pattern for negative 1 times negative 1? Well, look at the nice pattern that we have going here. The a's are just going down by 1. And what's happening to the negative 1 times a's? They're just going up by 1. They just have the opposite sign. So if this is going to keep going, negative 1 times negative 1 should be positive 1. So we got a nice pattern here. So if this pattern is going to continue, negative 1 times negative 1 has to be positive 1. Let's do it another way. One of the things that we want is we want some of the properties of our numbers to still work. For example, the zero multiplication property needs to still work. The additive inverse property still needs to work. The distributive property still needs to work the multiplicative identity property, and so forth. Our basic properties need to still work when we go away from the natural numbers and work in the integers. So if that's the case, we can use the following as a proof. 0 has to be negative 1 times 0 because of the 0 multiplication property. But 0 could be rewritten as negative 1 plus 1, and then we're going to multiply by negative 1, right? So negative 1 plus 1 is 0. That's because of the additive inverse property. Now we can use the distributive property. Negative 1 times negative 1 plus 1 has to be negative 1 times negative 1 plus negative 1 times positive 1. And of course, since that was equal to 0 in the previous step, this is equal to 0 in this step. Well, we know what 1 times negative 1 is. That's negative 1 by the multiplicative identity property. So now what do we have? We have 0 equals negative 1 times negative 1 plus negative 1. Well, that means that negative 1 times negative 1 is the additive inverse of the negative 1. Remember, the additive inverse says 
whatever this number is, call it a, what do we have? We have 0 equals a plus a negative 1. Now this a is the additive inverse of negative 1. Well, we already studied this, that the additive inverse of negative 1 is, there's only one thing it can be, it's positive 1. So neg negative 1 times negative 1 has to be the additive inverse of negative 1, which is positive 1. And so we've proved that negative 1 times negative 1 has to be positive 1. So if we want our patterns to extend from the natural number or the or interpretations of things that we know work, and we want to extend those patterns, or we want to take our properties that we worked out before for natural numbers and what, for uh, other possibilities with integers, if those properties are still going to work, we don't have a choice. Negative 1 times negative 1 must be positive 1. So that leads us to some basic little rules here. The additive inverse of the opposite of a is a. So the inverse of the inverse of a is a. So in other words, another way to say this is negative 1 times a is the inverse of a, the opposite of a. Now if you have two negatives, negative a times negative b, then you can think of, of that as negative 1 times a times negative 1 times b. And a combination of the associative and commutative properties says we can group and rewrite these any order we want as long as it's all multiplication. And so we can put the two negative ones times each other together to make positive one. And so we have positive one times a to, times b, which is just ab. So this allows us to do some things like this. If we want to multiply two numbers together, we can first of all ignore their signs. Look at the absolute value. And we know that the absolute value of the product is the product of the absolute values. So the size of the thing we can get by just multiplying the, the, the two numbers together, ignoring the signs. Then we have to decide what kind of sign it has on the answer. Well, some of this is pretty obvious. Two positives multiply together get a positive. A negative and a positive, or a positive and a negative multiply together in either order, gives us a negative. But as we've seen, two negatives multiplying together gives us a positive. You can think of the two negatives canceling each other out. In fact, since these can cancel each other out in pairs, a product of a whole bunch of numbers, if there's even number of negatives in them, the answer is going to be positive. If there's an odd number of negatives, the answer is going to be negative. And so these rules must hold in the integers if we want these properties and patterns that we establish with natural numbers to extend to the integers. So that's why this is a natural extension of our natural number of multiplication. But notice we've extended multiplication beyond just thinking of it as repeated addition, at least in the case of a negative times a negative. So here's some simple problems. You should be able to do these in your head without using any technology. Why don't you whip the answers to these out here real quickly and then come back in a second. Press pause now. Well, let's see. Negative 3 times negative 7 It'll be 3 times 7 is 21. We have two negatives, makes it positive. 5 times 8 is 40, both positive, so we get a positive answer. Negative 6 times 5, 6 times 5 is 30. We have an odd number of negatives here, so we get a negative answer, negative 30. 8 times 3, 3 times 8 is 24, but we have one negative, so the total of odd number of negatives, so we get a negative answer, negative 24. Now let's go back to multiplication here just a minute minute and think of uh, natural numbers here. So because of the commutative property, there are two interpretations of a multiplication. Remember a times b and b times a give you the same answer. a times b, remember we're thinking of is taking b and going b plus b plus b a times. So a, b's added together. In other words, a total of a groups with b in each group and that forms a rectangular area a tall and b wide. Whereas b times a, here we're thinking of it's the a that we're adding over and over again, a plus a plus a, b times. So b groups and a in each group. That's a rectangular area again, but this one's b tall and a wide. Now I just want to review that before we talk about undoing it. Okay, so one of the the uh, themes of this little lecture and series of lectures is that we want to do mathematics and then undo that mathematics. So if we want to undo multiplication, what do we get? That's the inverse operation multiplication. Well, you know that. We call it division. So the inverse operation of multiplication is called division. 
And so we have a fact family like this. If we say A divided by B equals C, then that's the same thing as saying B times C equals A or C times B equals A. So in other words, if uh, 6 divided by 3 is C, then 3 times C equals 6, and C times 3 equals 6. So what's C? Oh, of course, the C is 2 here. Easy, easy example. So what we're doing is when we're, when we're doing division, we're undoing multiplication, but we can also think of it as um, a missing factor problem. So anytime we do a division, like 6 divided by 3 equals C, we're solving one of the two problems, 3 times C equals 6, or C times 3 equals 6. And, and I'm thinking these as two different things because each one of the, the interpretations of multiplication gives us a slightly different interpretation for the division. So there's basically two interpretations for the division. Each one corresponds to one of these missing factor interpretations. So if we want to do 6 divided by 3 again, so that's either solving the problem 3 times C equals 6, or solving the problem C times 3 equals 6, trying to find out what C is. So if we do 3 times C equals 6, what we're doing is we're taking 6 items and we're arranging them into 3 groups, and the question is, how many are, each, are in each group? The second factor is what we don't know. Remember, the second factor tells us how many are in each group. So a real-world problem that would go with that is take six pieces of candy and distribute them equally to three people. How many pieces of candy does each person get? And the answer is six divided by three equals two pieces. Because, why? Because three times two equals six. Or as an area thing, you could arrange the six items into a rectangle with three rows. How many columns are there? And again, the answer is two. The other interpretation, C times 3 equals 6, and find C, this time, again, we're starting with 6 total items. We know that, but we want to arrange them into groups of size 3. This time, we know the size of the group. What we don't know is how many groups do we have, and so that's the question we're answering. So a real-world example is uh, we have 6 crayons, and we want to make bags of 3 crayons each. How many bags can we form? And the answer is 6 divided by 3 equals 2 bags. So again, if we think of it arranging into a rectangle, this time we know the number of columns, or the width is three columns, or the width is three, and the question is how many rows, or how tall is it? The answer is, of course, two. Some terminology and symbols that we might use. Uh, these are all equivalent. We can say A divided by B equals C, with this kind of, this line with the two dots symbol. We can have a slanted line for division. A divided by B is C. We can have a horizontal line like this, A over B, A divided by B is C. Uh, we can have this kind of long division setup where we have A divided by B is C. And of course it's equivalent from our fact family is these two multiplications, B times C is A and C times B is A. Of course down here we say that B and C are products, uh, A is the product and B and C are the factors or divisors. Up here in these other notations, a is the dividend, B is the thing we're dividing by, is the divisor, and the answer is called the quotient. So A over B is C is a quotient. Uh, if you're thinking of the second or third notation here, we can also think of this as a fraction. And if you're thinking of it as a fraction, then the, the top part, the, the dividend, is also called the numerator, and the bottom part, the divisor, is also called the denominator. Alright, so the idea is we, we've talked about multiplications, repeated addition, now we're going to go backwards and undo it by division. Then the question comes back to the set of natural numbers. Is it closed under division? How about the set of integers? We went to a bigger set already. What if we stay in the integers? Is it closed there? I'll let you think about this a second and see if you can come back with an answer. Press pause now. Okay, well, the question is, if we take two natural numbers and divide them, do we always get a natural number for an answer? How about if we start with two integers and divide, do we always get an integer for an answer? Well, if the answer is no, all you have to do is come up with one example where it doesn't work. If the answer is yes, well, then, then that's a, that would be an interesting thing that we'd need to do. Well, let's take a look at it. Now, some things we can divide just fine in the natural numbers. You know, 14 divided by 7 is 2. 
15 divided by 3 is 5. Those are nice little natural numbers all the way around. Uh, no problems. But there are divisions that cannot be performed in either the natural numbers or the integers. Here's some of the easy examples. 1 divided by 2 is probably the easiest one to think of. Uh, others, 18 divided by 5, 28 divided by 15. These are, these are examples where these are not integers. Okay, so the set of natural numbers is not closed under division, neither is a set of integers. So if we want to undo multiplication, in other words, solve missing factor problems, we need to develop a larger number system than the integers. Notice, to undo addition problems, or to do subtraction, we had to go from the natural numbers to the, to the integers. And now if we want to do division, we've got to go a step further. And this is going to expand our system. But of course, if we want to do this in such a way that it's, it's going to, this new system is going to contain the integers, which contain the natural numbers, and it's going to be consistent with what we'd seen earlier. So let's say, see what we've got here. If you've got, uh, let's just say if you've got 12 blocks and you want to divide it evenly among four uh, groups, that is you want to arrange them in a rectangular arrangement where you know that it's four tall. Of course, you can do that with three wide, just like the green blocks down here. But what if we have 13 blocks and we want to divide them evenly among four groups? So the idea is you want to take 13 blocks, make them into four groups, and it's got to be the same in each group. Same thing as saying we want to arrange those 13 blocks in a rectangle, and it's got to be four tall, and each row has to have the same. Well, if you're only allowed to do this in natural numbers, this is an impossible problem. There's no way you can get it. In fact, the closest you can do is to get, um, get three blocks per row, but then you've got this one block left over that we call the remainder. In fact, sometimes you'll see division done that way. You'll say 13 divided by 4 is 3 with the remainder 1. But that's not really dividing it all out. Okay? So what we could do is take that last block and cut it up. If we could cut it up into four equal size pieces, sub-pieces, pieces, smaller pieces, then we can do that. We can give each one of those sub-pieces uh, to each of the others. And each one of those is one-fourth, we call it, of that uh, larger amount. And so this leads us to the idea of fractions. Okay, And fractions are what we call rational numbers. So we define a rational number is defined to be a number that can be put in the form p over q, where p and q are integers, and the one at the bottom, the q, the denominator, is not zero. And we call this representation of a rational number in this form a fraction, with the number p being called the numerator of the fraction and q the denominator. We use the symbol q for quotient. Remember the, the answer to a division. This is basically a division, p divided by q, or down here I have a over b. And it is um, q, q for quotient, because that's the answer to it, okay, to a division problem. And because later on we're going to have a set that starts with R, the real numbers, and we use an R for that one. So we're going to use Q for, for the rationals. And so here I, I switch from P's and Q's to A's and B's, but it's the same thing. Uh, it's a set of all numbers of the form A over B, such that, now the vertical line means such that, A is an element of the set of integers, and B is an element of the set of integers, and B is not equal to zero. Notice if b is 1 and the top is an integer, that's going to basically be an integer. And if it is, uh, so all the integers are inside the rational numbers, but we have things like 1 half, for example, that are not integers that are in the rationals. So can we think of these as locations on our number line? And the answer is yes. What we can do here is we take something and divide it up. So when you think of a fraction, like the fraction 3 fifths, that means you take whatever the one whole is, you break it into five equal parts. So the denominator tells you how many equal parts that you have the whole broken into, and the top tells you how many of those parts you actually have. So if you notice, this distance from 0 to 1 is broken into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 equal pieces across this top here. 
and we've gone across, shaded, and selected three of those blue ones. So this, this amount, if this is a, a, an area from, from here, this bar was one, then the area we have shaded is three-fifths. If this is a length from zero to one, then the length of this bar is three-fifths. Or if you think of this as a number line, this location right here, of this dot at the end of the bar, that is the location three-fifths. But something interesting happens about fractions. This is the 9 fifteenths of the red, and the green is 12 twentieths. But if you notice, they're all really the same location. So in fact, uh, there are actually infinitely many different fractions that represent the same number. So if you have any number a over b, and you multiply the numerator and denominator by the same number, not zero, uh, n times a over n times b, then that turns out to be the same fraction. So those, they are equal, they're equivalent. They're different fractional representations of the same actual number, the same location on the number line. So that, sees how, that shows you how we can visualize a fraction as a, a, uh, as a number on a number line, a location. So notice that this fills in actually some but not all of the points in between the whole numbers and the in between the integers on our number line. So now we're almost to a straight number line, solid number line, but not quite. Now notice we had a restriction here of the B being non-zero. Why do we have this restriction that we can't have a B, a denominator of zero? Or in other words, how, why can we not divide by zero? So A over B equals C is A divided by B equals C, so that's another way to say that is A has to be B times C. Well, let's consider a couple of examples here. What if we had a zero on the top? So, for example, zero divided by two. Zero divided by two or zero over two is a fraction. Well, if that's C, then that's true, then the two times the C has to be zero. Well, as we discussed with the zero property multiplication, the only possible out answer for this is C is 0. So 0 divided by 2 has one and only one possible answer that is 0. So it, it does work. That's just fine. So 0 divided by any number is 0. Uh, 0 over any number is 0. As long as the denominator is not 0, that's going to be just fine, and it's going to be one answer. But what if we put a 0 in denominator? Let's take an easy example like 3 divided by 0. So 3 divided by 0, or 3 over 0 here, suppose that's C. The only way that can happen is if 0 times C is equal to 3. But now wait a minute, 0 times C is 0, and so the only way this could happen is when 0 equals 3. Well, that's not possible. So in this case, there is no C that would work. So nothing works. It's impossible. So 3 divided by 0, or 3 over 0, has to be undefined. It doesn't make any sense. It's not possible. So we cannot have a zero in the denominator, or we cannot divide by zero. Now let's look at zero divided by zero. It gives us actually a different, kind of the opposite problem. Zero divided by zero, or zero over zero is C. That says that the bottom zero times C equals the top zero. What C makes that true? Well, zero, uh, one, five, 427, whatever your favorite number is for C. When you multiply by 0, you get 0. So any value for C works. Anything works. It's exactly the opposite problem of 3 divided by 0 where nothing works. But again, it's really just as bad uh, because we want only one possible answer for this to make sense. And so 0 divided by 0 is what we call indeterminate, but it's still, still undefined. So any number divided by 0, or any number over 0, is actually undefined for any value of a. 0 divided by 0 is undefined. Uh, any other number divided by 0 is undefined. So division by 0 is undefined. A 0 in the denominator of a fraction is not allowed. All right, so let's try a few exercises here. Construct a real-world application that corresponds to the operation 10 over 5. Let's actually do this twice. One will correspond to solving the missing factor problem 5 times a is 10, and then the other one will correspond to solving the problem a times 5 is 10. Go ahead and figure out a real-world example that come, does this, and we'll check your answer here in a minute. Press pause now. 
Okay, as we come back here, what we want in the first interpretation, remember, is the 5 is the number of groups and the A is the number per group. We have a total amount of 10. So we want, to, we want some kind of real world scenario where we start with 10 items, we want to break it into 5 groups, and we want to ask how many is in each group. For example, we have 10 party favors. We want to distribute them equally among 5 gift bags. How many favors will be in each bag? The answer is 10 divided by 5, which is 2. So, uh, in other words, 5 times 2 is 10. So each bag will have 2 favors. And A times 5 is 10. That's the other way around. This time, we want to do 10 divided by 5, but this time, again, we start with 10 items, but we want to put them in groups of size 5, and we want to ask how many groups that we have. For example, we have 10 snacks, and we want to package them so that there are 5 snacks per package. How many packages can we make? Well, the answer is 10 divided by 5 is 2, so we can make 2 packages. Okay, let's keep going with some exercises here. Just some terminology. Consider the division problem 18 divided by 3 equals 6. We call 18 what? What do we call the 3 and what do we call the 6? And see if you can locate these numbers on a number line. You're going to have to divide it up carefully. So think about how, actually there's one particular division that's going to work for all of these fractions. And so get yourself out some graph paper that's already kind of divided up. Decide where you need to place one so that your division is going to work for you. And then make yourself a number line and work this out. So let's give you a few minutes to work that out, and then come back after you've done that. Press pause now. Well, the number that we, the total number is called the dividend, so 18 is the div dividend. The number we're dividing by is 3, the divisor, and the answer to the problem, 6, is called the quotient. Now if you notice, the, the least common multiple of all of these denominators is 12. So if I take a number line and from 0 to 1 divide it into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 equal pieces and do that same scale all the way across this number line, then I'm going to be able to get the fractions here. So this is starting here at 0, it's 1 twelfth, 2 twelfths, which is 1 sixth, 3 twelfths, which is 1 fourth, 4 twelfths, which reduces to 1 third, 5 twelfths, 6 twelfths reduces to a half, 7 twelfths, 8 twelfths reduces to 2 thirds, 9 twelfths reduces to 3 fourths, 10 twelfths reduces to 5 6, 11 twelfths is reduced, and then 12 twelfths reduces to 1, and so forth. And so then we can find these things. Here's a half, um, uh, 5 twelfths, 1 fourth, negative 1 third, 13 twelfths, and 11 6. You can see all these things as the red dots on this number line. So we can find any fraction, we can find it if we just divide this up the right way, we can find any fraction on our number line. All right, a couple more exercises here, a few more. Uh, make three other fractions that are equivalent to three-fifths. So they're going to be equal as numbers, but they're going to be different looking fractions. Now we say that a fraction A over B is reduced if the greatest common divisor the greatest common factor of the numerator and denominator is 1. Okay, if it, if it turns out to be an integer, uh, equivalent to an integer, then we just use the integer form as the reduced version. So here are several fractions. Go ahead and reduce those and then as do this other question as well. Please do that now. Press pause now. Okay, now I hope you guys are really doing this in terms of pressing pause and writing the answers down to these problems before you go on. Even if you already know how to do this stuff, and a lot of this stuff is at the beginning here is, is a hopefully uh, very familiar to you, um, it's still useful to practice it a little bit. So I, I really, you really need to do this press pause when you're working through all of these things because you're going to gain a lot by doing the work yourself. Uh, so if you haven't done that, press pause now and do it. But if you have, let's go ahead and check your answers. So any of the fraction of the form 3 times A over 5 times A will work. So, for example, if A is uh, 2, we've got 6 over 10. If A is 3, we've got 9 over 15. If A is 4, we've got 12 over 20. And there's, there's infinitely many different possibilities here. But there's only one reduced version. So the greatest common divisor of 6 and 8 is 2. So we divide top and bottom by 2, we get 3 fourths. 
if we the greatest common factor of 125 and 35 is 5, divide top and bottom by 5, we get 25 sevenths. The greatest common factor of 21 and 91 is 7, so if you divide top and bottom by 7, you get 3 over 13. 8 divided by 4 is just 2, so that's a whole number. We just write it as 2. Um, that's, that's, it's also 2 over 1, but uh, we'll use 2 as the reduced version. Um, of course, negative 6 over 24 is a negative number. The 6 over 24 has a common factor of 6 for the numerator and denominator. Divide top and bottom by 6, we get 1 fourth. The two negatives here are going to cancel out. If they got two negatives, in the, a negative in the top and negative in the bottom, uh, we're going to uh, say it's reduced as we got as few negatives as possible. So this turns out to be a positive number, and the greatest common factor of 8 and 12 is 4, so that divides out to be 2 thirds. 0 divided by any non-zero number is 0, so that one's 0, but a 0 in the denominator is undefined, so the last one there is not really possible at all. It doesn't exist. It's undefined. Now it turns out that we can take our fractions and we can also write them in a decimal expansion form. And if we have a, a, a fraction, to convert it to decimals, we use the long division algorithm, uh, which you can see illustrated here. So if we want to take one-fourth, for example, right here, it is uh, one, and then divide by four, you can divide it out, add a decimal, keep adding zeros, and if you ever get a, denominator, a, a remainder of zero, then we have a, what's called a terminating decimal. And so that can be written as 0.25. You can see the details there. However, if you're doing this process and you end up getting a remainder that you've had before, the ones match here when we're dividing out one-third, that says the next one's going to be three again. So we're going to have a 10, and the next one will be three, and there'll be a nine, and it's going to be one, and the next one's going to be three, and a 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 three. It's three going on forever. And so we see this three repeating, which is what that bar means. Okay? So it turns out that if you divide these out, you're always going to get either a terminating or a repeating pattern to a decimal. Well, it turns out that you can go the other direction, too, that if you have a terminating decimal or a repeating decimal, you can turn it back to a fraction. Okay? So there's actually two different techniques, one for repeating decimals, one for terminating. So for terminating decimals, we've got 0.36. You just... Uh, in fact, you would actually read this as 36 hundredths, and that's how you write it, is 36 over 100. Just count how many decimals, write the number without the, without the decimal point, 0, 3, 6, or just 3, 6, in the numerator. Count how many places are to the right of the decimal, and that's how many zeros you have after your 1 here. In other words, what power of 10 you use in the bottom. This is 10 to the second, or 100, two zeros here, for the denominator, and now you have it in fraction form. Of course, we can reduce that if we want. In this case, it's 9 25ths, because you can uh, cancel out a 4 at the top and bottom. Now, it's a little more difficult to go for a repeating decimal. So let's take an example here. If x equals 0 0.3262626262626, so the 2 and the 6 are in a repeating pattern. We're going to call that x, and we want to find out what x is in fraction form. Now notice we have two digits in the repeating pattern. I'm going to multiply by a 10 to the second power, 1 with two zeros, in other words 100, by both sides. So that's going to give me 100 times x is 100x. But 100 times this is going to move the decimal two places to the right. So we're going to have 0, we're going to have 3, 2, point, then a 6, 2, 6, 2, 6, 2, 6. Now I'm going to subtract from that the original x, the original number. So 100x minus 1x is 99x. The 32.6262626226, etc., is then subtract 0.32626226226. Well, 32626 is, is there. And notice I can line up the, these in such a way that the repeating pattern here, this infinite tail of 26262626 over and over again, all cancels each other out. So all this stuff with the bar over it is going to cancel out when we subtract. Now what's left? 6 minus 3 is 3. There's our decimal point. 32 minus 0 is 32. 100x minus 1x is 99x. Now, 
We've gotten rid of the worst part, which was that infinite tail, but we still have a decimal in the ca this case. It's a one place, so I multiply both sides by 10 to clear that out. On the right side, then I'll move the decimal one place to the right, increasing everything in place value. Tenths go to units, units go to tens, tens go to hundreds. Similarly, on the, on the left, 10 times 99x is 990x. And if we have a missing factor problem here, how do we solve it? By division. We want to find x. We have to divide by 990. And so now we have x as our fraction, 323 over 990. And we can use a technique like this for repeating decimals, the technique like we used on point three six. we can use for terminating decimals. So the bottom line is this. Since we can take any fraction of, of integers, okay, not zero, not divide by zero, but any other one, any rational number, we can turn it into either repeating or terminating a decimal. We can also take any decimal that's repeating or decimal that's terminating and turn it back into a fraction. So that tells us that the set of rational numbers is exactly the same thing as the set of repeating or terminating decimal numbers. So let you try, let you try this now with these four examples. This is going in the direction where we start with the fraction and you should get this in a decimal. Now you're going to have to divide these out by hand, no calculators here, until you get a repeating decimal pattern or a terminating decimal pattern. You can check it with the calculator at the end, but let's, let's try to do it out without a calculator. Go ahead and do these now. Press pause now. Oops. I don't have the answers to that one worked out. I had them worked out and I lost it. Okay, we'll uh, come back to that later. Well, I'll just I'll just tell you the answers real quick, and I'll let you work out the details. Five eighths is point six two five. Seven twenty fifths is point two eight. Those are terminating decimals. Thirteen over one fifty is point. 086 with the 6 repeatings. So that's a repeating pattern. And 5 sevenths has a 7 digit repeating pattern, point seven one four two eight five, And then the entire pattern repeats again. 714285. 714285. 714285. Okay, convert these decimal numbers into reduced fraction form and unfortunately they're the answers. Okay, so you should try to do this yourself and then uh, come back and check them against the work here. But there are the details worked out. I'll let you study that. You may want to press pause now and um, work through these. Actually it'd be best if you write the numbers down in blue real fast look away from the screen, work it, come back. Okay, so here we go. How about closure of rational numbers? Well, the set of rational numbers is closed under the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division with one exception. You can't divide by zero. But with except for that one exception, they are closed. All right, so that concludes our second video. We'll come back in the third video and talk a little bit about exponents, radicals, real numbers, complex numbers, and order of operations as well.